And I'm just going to let you guys pretty much talk. Okay. I, I, I feel like you guys can probably talk amongst yourselves. I'll try to direct <laughs> it to, to kind of what the what, you know, union you picked activity. picked up on that already. Yeah. That yeah. general, but he got an earful already. The interaction with you guys is a multi-generational thing. He's rolling pretty cool. Now he, wants, now he wants the other ear full. <laughs> you ready? Yeah. All right. Oh, you ready? My name's uh, Robert Lee Reynolds, Sr., and uh, I'm a former Borg Warner employee. Can you spell your name for us? Yeah, it's uh, R-O-B-E-R-T-R-E-Y-N-O-L-D-S. Uh, I'm Robert's father. My name is Bruce Reynolds, B R U C E. R E Y N O L D S, and I worked at uh, Warner Gear for 32 and a half years from 1973 to 2005. And I'm Robert E. Reynolds. I worked at Warner Gear uh, for 30 years and retired in 1980. And we'll just go back down, uh, down the line again and say hi, my name is. And then, and then we'll start the interview. Don't tell them you love yeah, the you international it, just, either. Just say it. Hi, my name's Robert Reynolds. I'm a former Borg Warner employee for three years. Uh, my name's Bruce Reynolds. I'm retired from Borg Warner after uh, 32 and a half years from 1973 to 2005. And I'm Robert E. Reynolds. Uh, I retired in April the 12th, 1908. <laughs> Almost said 50, my <laughs> RN day. That was your RN day, yeah. Yeah, that can't work. Now, now we're interested in, uh, so did everyone just, just follow after after Grandpa here, after Robert? Um, what got you yeah. into working at Ward Warner? Well, my dad worked there. Actually, my father-in-law got me hard on. Uh, Donald Osborne, he got me hard on. And, uh, of course, I, I wanted to work with my dad. I thought that would be really neat. Um, uh, it was a good living. Uh, there was, there's, of course, with everything, there's upsides and downsides. A lot of times, it seems like you were more, you were laid off more often than than you were. Uh, but you you learn to cope for them layoff years. You learn you had outside jobs and uh, where you, if you did get laid off, you you went to uh, look for employment at. Um, so I always try to keep an extra job on the side just in case if I would get laid off, I'd have something to fall back on. And then uh, when Rob... I, yeah, <laughs> I think for me, it, it, was, it was really cool to, to, to see the older parts of the factory, the newer parts of the factory, going in and being able to see where my grandfather worked, both of my grandfathers actually, uh, and my dad. And, uh, my dad's probably my biggest hero, so for me to, to kind of walk in his footsteps and and uh, trample the same soil that they did, that was that was pretty awesome. And and the pay was good, and yeah, you know, there were upsides, downsides. You know, you had to, you might work for three months and be laid off for six, but uh, it, you knew that going in, so you just kind of you know rolled with the punches and did what you had to do. So. Yeah. It was really neat to have my dad and my son work there. Um, it, it, <laughs> of course, my, my, I just got started actually. Dad retired in 1980 and I came to work in 73. But during that time, like I said, more often than not, I was laid off. But uh, we got to visit a lot while he was working. And, and then later on, uh, years later, my son got hired on. Unfortunately, I was hoping he'd be able to retire out there also. Um, I knew it, it did provide a good living for us and everything. And at the time, you know, you hear rumors of plant closures and things like that, and they always threaten us with that at, at contract time. Um, but you never dream um, that would happen. And of course, you never dream that the business cycle would revert to where it's at now, where they pay corporations to relocate overseas. And it's kind of unfortunate. Uh, I was involved in union activities for many years, trying to get my son involved, and uh, uh, and I thought unionism was was a and I still believe it is. It's a terrific idea. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes uh, human ideals uh, get compromised, uh, and that's happened with unions. But I think overall, unionism is an awesome thing. Uh, it's designed to help those folks who are weaker and can help themselves. And, and standing together as one unit, as a body, 
uh, is just an awesome ideal. Um, that's one reason why I tried to get my son involved in it. And uh, reluctantly, he started leaning that way. And unfortunately, it just didn't happen until the point in time that he got uh, laid off. He was starting to head that way, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I wanted to get more involved in the union. And, and uh, I started off kind of slow. I didn't really want to be into the politics. I, growing up, I seen the things that my dad struggled with, the things that he had to go through. Um, and the trials and tribulations, I mean, it's not all, you know, it's not all sunshine and glory, you know, they, there's a lot of dirty work and a, and a lot of things that uh, he probably didn't want to have to deal with that he did. And uh, I was always proud of the fact that he dealt with the tough things, you know, the things that you, you wouldn't normally want to deal with, you know, I think unions are great too. I think like many other things, there are, there are downfalls. You know, sometimes you're fighting for people that don't deserve to have their jobs, that don't appreciate their jobs, but, but that's part of it because we are a band of brothers. You know, we're, we're, we're a band of generation men here, but, but you're, you're a band of brothers outside of that as well. I mean, you're, you're a group of guys that are struggling for the same things. You want better lives for your family. I think my grandfather wanted better things for his son. My dad wanted better things for me. I want better things for my children. Um, so, so those are all things, and I think as, as a union, as a group of men, as a group of men and women, we all wanted those things for our families. And, and we knew that, that the union could do that for us. Um, I think somewhere along the line, we got too weak. We, we let the corporations have too much control. We let them dictate to us how things were gonna go, and we backslid way too much. Um, I think people were living for the future and they weren't fighting enough for the people that laid the foundation for us. They let their things slip, you know, not really caring about the people that were gone and, and laid the bricks for us to follow. And I think in turn that came back to bite us all. I mean, um, the more and more we gave, the more and more they took. So, yeah, I remember coming in the first. Uh, well, after about a year and a half, and you get to know a lot of people, and I always admired a lot of the early union people um, that were the founding fathers, so to speak, of Local 287, and hearing their stories and everything really gave you uh, inspiration, I, to me anyway, uh, and gave me an idea of what unionism was about, what they were trying to achieve. Uh, and so some of those early guys, like Tony Griffey and a few others, were just awesome union people, weren't they, Dad? Yeah. Kenny Bowles. Yeah. Those guys had union blood running through them, and uh, I wanted to impart that with my son, and I think all my children, even though um, none of them is involved in union activities now, uh, they still bleed union. Uh, they understand my son was actually a supervisor, my oldest son. Uh, and uh, he never had a grievance wrote against him. Um, and I think that's admirable. Um, so uh, Rob here, he grew up union. He still bleeds union. He understands what unions are worth. Uh, it's like he said, it's unfortunate that we've strayed away from that path. And I seen being hired on in 1973, I was fortunate enough uh, that I got to talk with a lot of the early generation, the guys that were in on the, the building blocks of the union, the unionism at Warner Gear. I got to hear them and hear their stories. So it gave me a really great idea what unionism was about. Unfortunately, later on in years, I think a lot of the uh, uh, younger guys, when they came in, they were pretty much was their idea was what can unions do for me as opposed to what can unions can do for the whole of us. Uh, and it got to be um, people running for office to feather their own nest as opposed to running for office to better the, uh, the people as a whole. Uh, my son knows his dad and he knows the reason why I ran for office was I wanted to help people. That was my goal. It's not what my position or uh, my job could do for me was to help people. Um, and I think we lost that a lot with the younger people. Um, politics boiled down to uh, party favorites and, and who was the buddy that 
drank beer with you down at the bar as opposed to who was the best person for the job, who was the most qualified. We had some outstanding people in unionism. We had a lot of people with college degrees that was working in the shop because it provided a good uh, uh, job for them and, and money. Um, and so we had a lot of intelligent people. Uh, it's just that, like I said, we had... I apologize. Singing, Bruce. Uh, Okay. Uh, was, it was it is my wife. <laughs> okay, I apologize for that. I forgot to turn it off. Um, but anyway, we had. Talking about unionism. Yeah, we had a group of people that I that I work with that was uh, truly dedicated to the ideal of unions. Uh, unfortunately, they get getting few and few, and I think they became disenfranchised. Uh, because of, they, of the politics. I remember the first time I ran for office. I had letters out on the picnic table that I did such and such a thing and <laughs> didn't have a clue what they were talking about, but it was uh, uh, politics is, is, uh, is a dirty business sometimes. And, um, in my, and when I was in politics, I'd get elected a lot of years and some years I would not get elected and simply because of the fact of hard truths. So sometimes you had to tell people that, hey, you know, I can't lie to you, this is the way it is. And that's, it's not, if you want to be successful long-term politically, uh, um, I think those folks learn to lie pretty well. Yeah. And uh, as opposed to telling the truth, sometimes the truth is hard to, hard to stomach. Yep, yeah, it's hard to swallow. Yeah. And I can tell you that's not my dad. I mean, he'll tell you the truth, whether you know it's what you want to hear or whether it's not what you want to hear. He's going to tell you the the cold hard facts, the cold hard truth. And I can remember growing up, I can remember people coming to our house with problems, you know. And my dad would step aside, you know, not on company time, not on you know his personal time, and help those people out. And those are the people that when I hired in couldn't sing enough praises about my father. You know, those were the people that would, you know, come up to me and shake my hand just because I was his son. You know, and, and you do, you get a sense of pride over that. You know, I, uh, there were a lot of people that admired my father. And, you know, we couldn't go anywhere where she, he doesn't know a stranger. You can't take him anywhere because everybody knows him and, and uh, or they've heard stories or, you know, and, uh, that's 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 awesome you know I, I kind of wanted that and, and I, at first when I got in I didn't because I I seen a lot of the ugly side of it too I seen the strikes the the picket lines the, the anger animosity and you don't you know you don't really want to be a part of that but but that's all part of it you know um, to be stronger to be a, a better physical group that's all part of part of it so I think um, but overall I mean I I couldn't have more pride or you know, respect for, for my father, for my grandfather, and for me, it was a no-brainer. I mean, walking into that situation and, and you know, being on the same soil that they were and, and shedding the same sweat and blood that they did and, and trying to, to keep that alive and going. And, and it, was, it was saddening and heartbreaking, you know, when it all kind of fell apart. And, you know, I, I only had three years in. And, and Brian, it sounds to me like, like, like the union was active in the community and that's oh, like, absolutely. that's oh, yeah. And, yeah. Know, how what does that do long term to a community like Muncie? So that's that's, that's Muncie now what is right. Muncie? A bunch of restaurants. Well, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be a goat stand. I can get that on tape. Yeah. <laughs> we'll probably make it into a reservoir. Keeps on with, well, restaurants. Now you now you stop and think. How in the world is restaurants, Ball Hospital, Ball State University going to keep this town going? And you can't go to the people much more because they're already paying enough taxes. And what are you going to do? No source of income to pay this. No <laughs> source of income. And without industry, man, you're in trouble because they Muncie needs industry. And if they don't, <laughs> they just might as well dig the big holes. Well, here's Muncie Reservoir. <laughs> Well, I, I, that's true. I, there was many years I know when I was involved in the union that um, we would hear rumblings and innuendos from our Chamber of Commerce that they wanted to change Muncie from a heavy industrial uh, town um, to um, 
um, college. Well, yeah, college university Usually. town, but um, more of a intellectual um, Silicon Valley type situation. <clears throat> and um, for a long time, we tried to discuss that with the Chamber of Commerce and explain to them with a healthy economy, you need all of the diversity because it's cyclic. When one uh, area of uh, business is down, you need another area to pick it up um, to help with the unemployment. We can never ever get that across, unfortunately, to the Chamber of Commerce. And everything in business is interactive. I, I don't care what business that you are in, it's interactive with other businesses. It's like Borg Warner. The loss of Borg Warner, and those at one time it was 8,000 jobs, and now that when they consolidated out here at Plant 3, I think it dropped down to 1,800. But still, the ramifications of losing that jobs is that if you've got other people and other businesses depending on Borg Warner. So you may only have 1,800 people out here working, but in an actuality, you probably affect closer to 20 to 30,000 people. Considering the, the families that is dependent on those incomes, the other businesses which uh, send parts out to Borg Warner, uh, and uh, it, it's, it's all interconnected. I know I had a discussion with uh, one of our human resources vice president at one time and he was explaining to me that we as a union need to take um, concessions. And I told him, I said, John, that's absolutely untrue. Unions don't need to take concessions. Unions and company need to get smarter on how they do business. And in doing that, you want to talk about long-term Longevity, longevity with a company, you, you, you get smarter on how you do business, interaction between the union and the union and the company should never ever be at odds for the most part. They should be working together because you have one goal and that is the success of that company. And now how you meet those goals may be a little different, but you should diverge. Those ideas should diverge to the fact that the, you want that company to succeed. And that was always always my premise when I was in union activities. I wanted that company to succeed. Now, I didn't want that company to succeed over the dead bodies of my brothers and sisters in the union and to abuse those people. And I don't think that's a goal that you, that's worthwhile if, if it's over the bodies of people. I think you can treat people decently and out of that decency, they will work for you. They will perform the job for you. Borg Warner never ever um, well, once Borg Warner went from a locally owned and operated entity and went corporate wide, nationwide, worldwide, they lost the vision for this plant and this facility. In doing so, that's one. That's the reason why. If you was to sum it all up, that's the reason why we we lost the jobs here in Muncie, Indiana. Corporate lost the vision for this plant. This plant, Muncie, built Borg Warner Corporation. The, the profits off of this company built Borg Warner Corporate. But there is no, there is no uh, decency in corporate America. Uh, they have no uh, care or concern about their employees. And bottom line is the dollar. And if that dollar can be better met overseas in China or in Mexico, that's where they're going. Uh, unfortunately, they don't realize once you start affecting the middle income people, like what we are or were maybe, uh, once you start affecting their income, it affects their profits, their business. They're no longer able to do business in this. And, it, and it indirectly, it'll eventually affect them. Uh, corporate America has never ever got smart enough to realize that. And so that's what I told John. I said, John, you got a, a degree in business administration. And I said, if I were you, I'd go back to your parents and ask for their money back because it, you did not get educated while you were out there because we're all part of a big will. We're all interconnected, whether you're corporate America or our middle class America, we're all interconnected. And once that will becomes broken and you take that one spoke out of it, it starts affecting the whole will and everything starts to fall apart. That's the reason why we're seeing the economy the way we are. And um, Muncie as a community in general, I yeah. think, you know, you can see it. Um, Muncie is now restaurants. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, I was born and raised, grew up here, went to high school here, went to college here. I don't live here now. 
because there is nothing here. There are no jobs here to um, that you can raise a family on. And me in general, I mean, I, I'm a divorced parent. Um, I've been remarried, but I have four kids. And there is nothing here unless I wanted to work at Pizza Hut the rest of my life or Blockbuster that uh, I could, you know, fall back on. I had to move closer towards Indianapolis to try to, you know, try to find some type of economy that would work. Um, now yeah. I, I'm real fortunate that, that uh, I remarried and uh, my wife has a high school or a college education. She's a school teacher, um, but she doesn't even teach around here. And... Uh, it's still tough. I mean, even with two economy, you know, two sources of income coming in, we, we still fight. I mean, I work two jobs, and uh, we, we still fight and struggle to make ends meet, you know. I, the, the two jobs I work together, I'm still about $10 less an hour than what I was making when I topped out at Board Warner before I left. <laughs> and, um, you know, that that's that's sad. And... Uh, it, it, it's sad that, you know, when I was growing up, my mom didn't really have to work. Now, she did odd men, part-time jobs, but, and my dad took great pride in the fact that his wife didn't have to work, you know. That's just not feasible in today's economy and today's lifestyle. And I think you can look at Muncie and, and the businesses that have gone away and the businesses that, that come and stay for a year, maybe two, and they're gone because there is no middle-of-the-road income people anymore to support those businesses you know you, you affect all those local businesses when you shut down that factory um, and, and the same thing with with ball corporation when they shut down you know that that affected Muncie too Borg Warner was still thriving then so we were kind of supporting the economy but since Borg Warner's gone away there's really nothing here that's that's helping this community to help these small business owners survive they're having to move elsewhere or just completely shut down and rethink their plans. And, and I just think it's a really sad situation. I mean, I, both jobs I work for are both non-union. They are both very uh, focused on staying non-union. Uh, they show videos when you hire in that unions are bad and that if you even speak the word union, it can cost you your job. And for me... You know, growing up in a union atmosphere, I want to stand up and say, are you guys nuts? But in the same token, I have to have these jobs. You know, I, I have to. It's not, it's not an option. Um, you know, I, I went to college. I went to Indiana Business College. It's not an accre accredited college school. So the degree I have in business management really does me no good. I can't even take it to a major university. I'd have to start all over. So basically, I wasted, you know, two years of my life. But, uh, so for me, I, I don't have anything else to fall back on. I, I'm pretty much, my hands are tied. I'm working for these companies that, uh, basically just run you over, you know. Uh, I work for one that, you know, I work 10 hours a day, every day, and they post it that way, but yet, if they don't want you there, if they decide, hey, we don't need you, we don't need the overtime, they'll cut it right then. If you had a union there, that, it wouldn't be like that. If they post that, you're going to work it. You know, they, they couldn't just string you along and, and, and uh, run you over and, you know, didn't like the shirt that you wear, so they send you home, you know. It, and I, I think people don't understand that. They don't understand, you know, they say, oh, the unions bled the economy. The unions didn't bleed the economy. Major corporations, corrupt corporations, corrupt people that wanted to line their own pockets bled the communities, you know. It, and I, I think unions get a bad rap. Um, but I think you can look at Muncie as a community and see the downfall. You can look at Marion, Indiana, and see the downfall. You can look at Anderson, Indiana, and you can see the downfall of all these unionized corporations that have gone. And these are now ghost towns, basically. There are nothing in these towns other than pretty much restaurants. A lot of your, uh, your friends, they have similar stories. Um, leaving Muncie. Are any of them still around here? Is there another snow job? I, a lot of my friends um, that I still speak to, I, one in particular, he's still here in Muncie. He's a uh, police officer for the Muncie Police Department. But of all of my friends, and I, I'm 
I'm not, I wasn't the most popular person, but I, you know, I played football, basketball, ran track. I, you know, uh, I was a fairly popular person. He's really the only one I know of that's still in Muncie. Um, the rest of them have moved on. Uh, they didn't even go to college around here. You know, they, they wanted to go to bigger colleges uh, to try to further their education. Um, but really all the people that I grew up with, went to high school with, um, none of them that I'm aware of are even still in Muncie. I, I believe they've all gone on, moved out of state. Uh, a lot of them have moved out of state just because there's just really nothing here, you know. Um, if you're fortunate, you can get on maybe at Ball Hospital, you know, or the police department, maybe an ambulance service, um, you know, you might have a chance. Um, but again, the, the community goes, you know, all those things are going to go too. Um, and I think you can look at our health care system um, and you can see that our health care system is in just as bad a state as, as the economy is. And um, where's that all going to lead? I don't know. I, I hope they get something figured out. But um, I think they've really hurt themselves with all the exporting of jobs overseas. Um, and they're letting huge corporations line their pockets, you know, and say, well, it's cheaper to send it over to Mexico. Well, granted, it may be cheaper, but who are you hurting? You're hurting the people that built those companies, that started those companies, you know, companies, mm -hmm. corporations that have been around 30, 40, 50 years. Look at the Chryslers, the Fords. Um, you know, those, those places are going to be non-existent real soon. And, and what are they going to have to show for it? No, nothing other than the people, the big corporation people, the executives are going to have their pockets lined, and yeah, they'll be set. But what about all the little people that help build up those corporations? They're all just thrown to the wayside. The consumer base is just eroding away. The folks that the middle income, the middle class who was able to buy that product is becoming non-existent, is dwelling. It's a proven fact that the middle class is eroding away. It's becoming pre-1920s, uh, where you had extremely rich, extremely wealthy, very few middle class, and the, and the poor. And that's where our country's coming to. And it's unfortunate that they want to talk about union greed, but uh, it, had, it does not hold a candle to corporate greed. It does not hold a candle to corporate greed. And, and we're talking apples and oranges. If they want to talk about union greed, it's not union greed, it's that they just wanted a better life for their folks that they represented. Uh, um, I know my dad was talking earlier about uh, uh, the international. I'm not the biggest fan of the international. I, I think in a lot of ways they got too big and got out of touch with the, the, the masses as for the most part. But the international in its day did some really great things. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. You you look at the examples. It wasn't corporate America that signed these programs into existence or pushed for their conception. It was the international. It was Union America that wanted to make a difference. It wasn't corporate America. It was Union America. Unfortunately, I'm not sure why we've not advertised that but it, it's too bad. I know a lot of, you talking earlier, Rob was talking earlier about his friends, and I know a lot of my friends who retired with me, uh, the so-called baby boomers, we're all going back to work because we cannot afford, um, our ret I, I look to see that retirement will be non-existent for us. We're, we're all going back. All my friends have all gone back to work. They've all looked for jobs because corporate America again has taken away our insurance premium, our benefits and everything else, and we've got to pay for those. Um, we can't afford not to go back to work. So we've got people out there that probably will never ever retire. Yeah, we'll, they've been five ninety-five dollars an hour jobs. Yeah, that's what they they're working. Nobody can live on that. I don't care who you are. But well, that's what you got to do, though. You, you've got to work those minimum yeah. wage jobs and. Uh, because there's two or three of them. Yeah, or two or three <laughs> of them. Because yeah. unfortunately, there's nothing better out there for the middle class. Uh, even I know uh, uh, I have a couple of nieces who uh, have degrees, and 
they're only making thirty thousand dollars a year and and four years of college and then going on to undergraduate work or things of that nature and only making thirty thousand dollars a year that's ridiculous absolutely absurd um that's basically when you pull out all that money that he poured out right exactly you, you think about all the money that, that goes into their education and everything but again uh, if, if you got to back to the unions, I mean, I think uh, if, if America rolled back to the union days, those wages, they do go up. They do go up. It's a proven fact that when unions are strong, it drives the wage base for everybody, non-union people alike, up. Yeah. As the opposite holds true, that as the unions decrease, the, the wages right. go back. It, you can tell. If you would take a survey today of Muncie, Indiana, and compare it to 10 years ago, I can almost guarantee you we probably have a drop of 18 to 20 percent in wages across the board in this city. Yeah. And it's a, it's a direct result of the union jobs declining because then you're in competition for those union jobs and those non-union facilities, they've, they've got to pay decent wages or they're not going to get those folks. Um, and I know uh, one merchant who will remain anonymous, one of my many part-time jobs when I was laid off at Borg Warner, I worked there part-time, and they were talking about uh, becoming union simply for the fact that the wages comparative to the union facilities were substandard. And uh, that's it's exactly the reason why they were talking unions, because they themselves, even though for the most part they were non-union people, they weren't exactly thrilled with unions, but they did see the discrepancy between a union and a non-union facility. Uh, and so, uh, unfortunately, uh, the gentleman who was starting that drive uh, got company jobs for some odd reason. I don't know how that happened, but they got into management roles and got an increase in pay and the union drive went downhill after that. But. Well, I worked down there in Florida for a big grocery concern. And these guys had to pay for their insurance. Now, well, whenever they would time to come around, they'd evaluate them, they'd give them so much raise. All right, here come the insurance. Well, we're going to raise, they'd raise the insurance. Well, them guys would end up with nothing. Well, this one poor little, little fella, he said. Reminds you of us now, doesn't it, Dad? Yeah. Come here, <laughs> We're in the same said, boat. He said, uh, Pop, he said, uh, you have to buy your insurance? I said, no, I'm getting mine from Warner Gear. Well, at the time, they were still doing fairly good. And he said, I can't figure it out. He said, every time we get a raise, they raise our insurance premium. Takes it right away from them. I said, I couldn't say nothing because it was non-union. So <laughs> the owner of the grocery concern, he said, uh, I'll never see a union in here. I said, hell, I got a good lock and chain. I'll just chain it up for you, you old fart. You don't want them in here. And oh, I'll tell you, I, I just hate to see people treated like that. that you don't treat dogs or animals like that. I mean, you know, you got to treat them like human beings. And me, that ain't, that ain't playing fair. And uh, I have felt so sorry for the guys. Of course, I couldn't say nothing to them. And uh, I thought, well, you know, I was working down in Florida is where it was. And they're, they're non-union down there. And I thought, well, you boys are suckers. Well, some of them were so dumb. They, if you'd asked what tune two was, they couldn't tell you it was four. They'd probably tell you it was three. They was that dumb about unions. And they wouldn't have no word saying about unions. Oh, no, boy, that was a dirty word. And I thought, well, boys, I so I don't know what to tell you. It just, you've got to, I don't know. Some people just, they, they don't think the union do them any good. Well, they're living in a false world because that ain't so. It don't work that way. The company's not <laughs> going to give you a raise. And, and if you've got to pay your insurance, 
You know what's going to happen? If he give you a dime raise, you know what that dime, dime, where that dime's going to go? Right on that insurance premium. You ain't going to get doodly spit. If you're lucky, you may get two cents raise. But that's the way they done them. And I, I really, I actually felt sorry for them. But I couldn't say nothing, you know. And uh, poor, poor little, yeah, he's a little old guy, but I don't know, he had several kids. You know, and his milk and bread cost him just as much as it did mine. And he said, Pop, they called me Pop, and he said, Pop said, you don't have to, do you have to buy your insurance? I said, no. I said, Warner Gear. It's got, and I said, well, I said, uh, you got a union there, ain't you? I said, well, yeah. You had to be careful what you say, because man, they'd break her neck going back there telling on you. So, yeah. so I thought, well, hmm, you're going to have to learn to keep your mouth shut. So I learned to keep my mouth shut, but boy, I'm telling you many a time I bit my lip. Oh, man. Well, I think uh, uh, corporate America has done a better job of propagating that myth that unions are corrupt and uh, bad for the economy. Uh, they've done a much better job, let's face the facts, they've done a much better job than unions have in presenting our story. Uh, that's too bad. But uh, corporate America has uh, done a really good job, propaganda-wise, uh, propagating that myth that unions are bad. Yeah. There's ignorance and, un and perceived notions of what yeah. they believe, you know, without knowing the facts, what they right. believe. You know, the, better, the fact yeah. it remains is they've got to have two horses to pull that wagon. You gotta have a company, you gotta have a union, and it gotta be right like that, or that wagon ain't gonna go nowhere. It ain't no way it'll happen. Because when you when you're fighting each other, you're not gaining anything. You're just cutting each other's throat. And they they think, Oh the man, the union yeah. and and the guy on the other side he says, Oh, the company, yeah. You got to get in there and close ranks, go down that road, pull, no matter how many ruts you get into, you've got to stay together and pull because if, it, if that's the only way it's going to work. Mm -hmm. And you cannot end up fighting each other day and night. You've got to get in there. You'll, you'll find out you've got some in the union as bullheaded as a day is long and company also they don't want to give in to the union. Well, they better get their heads together because two is better than one. Now, uh, now guys, yeah. when, I, when I think of unions not being, not being from a union family, yeah. um, I think that they, they provide job security, yeah. they provide insurance. But what, I, what I've learned from doing a little bit of research is there's a lot more unions. There's a community aspect within the union of a brotherhood. Now, yeah. something that we're interested in this project is kind of the, the activities outside of work that the kind mm -hmm. of the union kind of facilitated, whether it be picnics. Mm -hmm. can, oh, can, yeah. can you talk a little, maybe Rob, about growing up in the union? Um, We're you know, still having kind of things, picnics. Yeah, what kind of things I, happened there? For me, growing up in a union, the things that they did for our community brought it together. They owned uh, Springwater Park, and I can remember every summer we'd go out there and it was like a big family. There was hamburgers, hot dogs, potato chips, pop, you know, you, you could go fishing, you could go swimming, um, and they would auction things off, and most of it would go to charities, and, and uh, they, they really had a sense of community and oneness, and, and it wasn't all about, uh, you know, just the work Place. You know, people generally cared about each other. Yeah. Um, as, I, as I've said before, it, our house was open 24-7. If, if someone had a problem... I think, how many, how many people is that going to affect besides, besides us, the community? There's money you're taking out of the community that they're not going to get. And you're not going to you're not going to get it back unless you got a printing press in your backyard and run it out real fast because it never gets back. And I don't know why people's just got this here idea. Well, the union's broke 
broke the country. The Union broke the country. No. No. These big shots. The almighty dang dollar. Hey, I can go take my stuff over to Mexico, pay some guy $2 an hour to run the same kind of work. And have to pay the union man five, six, seven dollars an hour, where the job will be done right. And over there, how do you know it's going to be done right? I I've had people, come, a lady come and had a, a a Chevy. She bought a Chevy, and the ignition was from Mexico. That sucker went dead at four o'clock, and the mechanic said, "Well, we'll have to." Order one from Comfort. Now, if that ain't a bunch of baloney, now that that don't they can't say everything going bad, huh? Robbie, yeah. do, you, do you remember any of the uh, any of the company picnics that you guys attend as a? Did you bring Bruce as a, as a as a young kid to some of the company things? Yeah, I remember the basketball league Dad used to play in. It was sponsored by 287, and we got. Yeah. Uh, I used well, to go we watch him play that. Basketball. Yeah, we had uh, that and then uh, just about anything the union would sponsor, you know. And we, we was, there was a camaraderie there. We wasn't no better than nobody else. But we stuck together. We didn't, hey, I didn't sell this side out so I could go up the ladder. That ain't the way it was. We stuck together. And as long as you stick together, they can't beat you. They might try, but they can't. I can remember movies. They, The local 287 would sponsor movies, and they'd hand candy out to all the kids. Was mm -hmm. that for Easter, Dad? or That was for Christmas. Christmas. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, it was for Christmas. Mm -hmm. But we'd always, every year, and, and as, on your way, you know, they'd always sponsor a kid's movie. And uh, rent out a, yeah. a movie theater. It was up and we'd all get to really, go in mm -hmm. and, and yep. sit out there and watch a movie. And then when we were done, we got this big bag of candy. You know <laughs> that the that the local guys were. You know the usually it was the union team members, the presidents and and stewards and stuff were always standing out there handing out. But I can remember that. I, I can remember. I could remember taking tours of the plant. Um, they'd have like a. a field day you know and, and they'd bring all the families in and, and we'd have a picnic and there'd be games and they'd hand out different things and you yeah. could go through I remember one year when they first came out with the Dodge Viper we got to go out there and they had one sitting in the floor yeah. and uh, man that was cool I always wanted one of those cars but, yeah. uh, uh, there, there are a lot of good things I, yeah. the, the Springwater Park when they owned that that was awesome I and mean, we could go up there and go swimming whenever we wanted to go fishing yeah. And they always had picnics and stuff there every year, and and uh, you know they would they would honor the the people you know as far as like how many years of service they had. They'd hand out their watches and things at those. Um, but yeah, it was it was a great time. I mean, it was. It, I, I miss a lot of that. You know, I, I, uh, I that's something that I wish my kids could experience. That that unfortunately they probably never will. Oh. The unions did a lot of great community drives uh, we always had blood drives at Christmas we'd put up Christmas trees and everybody would adopt a family and bring in gifts for them uh, United Way we donate money to United Way at one time I think we were one of the biggest contributor if not the biggest contributor to United Way yeah, you just had to come straight out of your check you yeah sign up for it and you know you never you know five ten dollars a week whatever it was but you never missed it, you know, never seen it, and it was going for a great cause. Yeah. We had a welfare fund, somebody who was hurting. Uh, all they had to do was go to the union meeting and say, hey, I'm hurting financially and this is my need. And I've never seen anybody get turned away. Um, but that's what unions are about. I mean, it's the families and uh, doing community good. And if people would just could take uh, I mean, I, I wish we just had a documented history of the fact of all the events that 287 was participant right. in that a did good it. into the community yeah. and showed folks and then afterwards say, now tell me that unions are bad. Yeah. Now tell me unions are bad. Well, I think that hit a good point. The corporations have done a better job proving that unions are, are bad and they're bloodsuckers and leeches and, and the cis of the 
society than than the unions did. You know, maybe I guess instead of doing all those fundraising events and helping out those needy families, maybe we should have poured it back into propaganda supporting the unions, and uh, and maybe it wouldn't be to this point. Nah. But uh, I I don't I don't believe the unions were ever wrong in what they did. I I do wish that people had a better knowledge and understanding of. Um, of what the unions meant and the representation that they had. Um, now, is that to say that unions are perfect now? But th there is no perfect solution. But it no. was a nice common divider, you know, yeah. between corporate world and, and real working people. life, you know, yeah. real people, uh, real people's needs. And, and that's what unions met. They met the, the working person's needs, the working family, the community. They took care of those things. And I, you know, I think Muncie's a good point. You, you look at Muncie today and the economic state that they're in and the fact that there is nothing here. It's becoming a ghost town. Yeah. And why is that? It's because all of those union corporations, all those companies that had unions in them are gone. So you have, no, you have no one pouring back into the community. You have no one giving back. You have, you know, all the decent jobs are gone, which affect those small local little companies too. You know, the mom and pop shops that are trying to make a dime and a dollar here, and they can't do that anymore because there's no one there to support them. And, uh, you know, I, I do wish, like Dad said, that there was something out there saying all the positive things that unions have done. Yeah. Um, you know, and like I said, that's not to say that unions are perfect. There were things, many things, that i seen that I wish, you know, could have been changed. Yeah. And, and I think probably could have been had there been given an opportunity and those things could have been addressed. But it seemed like that the more important things to them were money issues and things of that nature. So, um, but in all, unions are great. I I wish I worked for a union, and um, I think my overall goal is probably to try to get back to a union state. Whether that's in a job I'm at now, trying to get a union there without losing my job, or if that's maybe moving to a different, you know, I don't think it's going to happen, so. Rob. I think the union. These here are corporates. They want, they want these unions invested. And well, they're I'm, not going to yeah. be satisfied till they get it. I believe not. that's true, Dad. But I think that pendulum has swung so far one way. I think it'll swing back. I, I truly right. believe. I hope this bill passes in Congress, where people can uh, ask to be involved in unions without the fear of being fired. I hope that passes. But going back to the, all these parties and things, and I mean, unions did so many good things besides oh, uh, negotiating contracts and, and things like that. I mean, they really tried to take care of family needs. Right. where families had a rough time and everything. And, and we were all in the same boat. All of us had gotten laid off at some point or another. And there was a lot of times, you know what? We'd be laid off, but the union still put on those, those Christmas shows. They put on those picnics. And where, I mean, you're strapped for cash, but there was always something special that you yeah. could take your family to. Yeah. You could, uh, you could have some candy or... Yeah, yeah. or see yeah. a movie or... Yeah. or uh, Get a set on Santa Claus knee or um, Easter egg hunt or uh, fishing and swimming and yeah. Yeah. I'd take off some of the heat time. when you yeah. don't, didn't have the money to do it. But right, uh, and the union provided that softball area. Softball games, baseball games, <laughs> yeah. basketball see here, games. Eventually, somebody's going to wake up and say, "Hey, what is these copper corporations do, done for us? What have they done?" Zilch. You don't see them handing out Christmas stuff for parties. Maybe give them a ten thousand dollar bonus or stuff crap like that. That's not nobody the else though. gets <laughs> that. Corporate people. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Nobody gets that. Well, I know the last year I was on the negotiating committee. I, that last year I spent more time. Uh, trying to keep the company corporation from doing just stupid business decisions than I had actually with labor relation problems. Because by that time I'd been in uh, uh, the union uh, leadership position long enough, I had a pretty good rapport with most business managers and I could call them up and resolve a lot of problems just by the phone. Say, hey, you know, Joe's got a situation here, can you help him out a little bit? 
ease up. He, he's got some family problems and we're trying to get him some help. Get it resolved by a phone call. But I spent more time, I remember uh, they closed down our NNS building and they had these buildings yeah. completely empty. Well, they were paying taxes and heating and air and all that stuff on these buildings. And they were paying $185,000 a year to store product in a private warehouse. And so I approached a plant manager. I said, hey, you know, this doesn't make a good business decision. Uh, why would you warehouse all this product on a private property at $185,000 a year when you got all this space in house? We can, we can warehouse it in here in house and we can keep a better eye on, on it and make sure it doesn't get damaged. And he turned to me and told me, we're not in the warehousing business. And I said, okay, the next time you come to me and plead poverty, I'm going to laugh in your face because evidently you got $185,000 to burn. Plus what you're spending on these buildings as far as utilities and, and property taxes and everything, overhead. So uh, shortly after that, they brought the product back into our building and uh, did away with the warehousing contract. But, uh, I mean, that was just one example. Uh, we had, um, um, through efforts, uh, we had a great uh, outsourcing uh, amendment to our contract. And that outsourcing agreement was, before any outsourcing could be done, it had to go before a joint company and union committee. Joint company and union committee. Before they could outsource it and prove that one, it was cost effective and two, quality effective to outsource it. And if those two things could not be proven, then they were to be kept in house. We saved those at the company millions of dollars. And one of the first things that when I left office, the company wanted to get rid of was that agreement. And so they did away with that joint outsourcing agreement. Um, we had one of the best ones. Uh, per international, they told us we had the best outsourcing agreement, bar none, in the United States. Uh, and we saved a lot of jobs by doing that. That didn't damage, didn't want to do it that way. Well, it was not only them, the company well, wanted right. to do away with it, but our union agreed to do away with it too, and we should have never done away with it. I mean, it was, it was, it was just a win-win situation for both sides. But that was some of the things that we faced in the latter years. Uh, I, again, I just think that, one, uh, our leadership was no longer Muncie-based, corporate-wise. It was all in, uh, up in Detroit, and they were pulling the decisions. And two, our leadership in the union wasn't adequate for the job. So I want to ask you one thing. Why did they move to Detroit? What for? What was, what was the cap? Why was it, why did it gain them? Uh, to be closer to the big three uh, corporate. Uh, Kiss my, what was it going to do, make love to them? <laughs> Kiss them? I don't know, Dad. That's something you'll have to ask them. Oh, I'll bet I wouldn't, I bet I wouldn't get a smart answer from them. Yeah. But I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. Why? You got it, you got it down here in Muncie. Why go to Detroit, Michigan? I imagine they're just about bad off as we are. Detroit's hurting, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, good for them. That well, gun, you know, yes. Three of you side by side like this. This is really rare and it's nice. Oh, thank I you. Think you guys will enjoy it too. When we, okay. Uh, edit it together and put in the documentary. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, you're welcome. Okay. I need a. Thank you. Go back.